Hi, this is Jenny Walker, and welcome to Closet Conversations. Today is part one of a series on how to open a consignment store. I was thinking about interesting topics that I could share with you, and I thought, well, why not start with what I've uh, been working on the last uh, three years and been entrenched with, and hopefully share some things that I learned that might be helpful to those of you who are listening. Now, I had always wanted to have a consignment shop uh, since I was very young. I went into my first one when I was 13, and uh, here in the uh, midsection of my life, um, I am now uh, operating and am co-owner of a consignment shop in Pasadena, California, called Walker Vine Luxury Consignment. Now, to say that um, I was uh, naive, <laughs> with a capital N, about what it meant to open up a store is uh, is really an understatement. And um, there's so much that I've learned. And, and I went into it, and I was, I was a little scared to commit to all of this. But I did commit, and I told myself, well, whatever comes up that I haven't experienced before, or I'm not prepared for, I will just figure it out as it happens. And needless to say, many things have come up that my business partner and I have figured out while they happened. And um, hopefully some of the uh, things that I've learned uh, you can benefit from. So in terms of opening up a consignment store, I think number one is um, asking yourself why you want to do it. Um, For me, the answer was it was something I'd been thinking about for a lifetime. I actually wrote a paper on starting a business like this years and years ago. I came across it recently and when I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had studied every shop in town. I'd met all the owners. I had shopped in them. I had consigned in many of them. And, you know, I just kept feeling this is something that I loved, would love to do. And I felt like I had something to contribute that was unique. And I was in a completely different career, um, in charity fundraising. And, uh, you know, a lot of things have changed in my life. And uh, three years ago, uh, when I moved from New York to um, Pasadena, California, um, I met someone uh, who thought I should be pursuing my dream. So we are now uh, operating this consignment store. So one of the things that really I didn't understand at the time, but, but kind of came up later is the question of, do you want to buy someone's store? It's already operating, or do you want to start one from scratch? Because that really has been um, a really interesting thing and a very interesting distinction. Because all the years I thought about having a consignment shop, quite frankly, it never occurred to me to buy one. It's just these were not thoughts in my head. I mean, um, I'm just inexperienced in these kinds of small businesses and and how they they come and go or or are bought and sold, and it never occurred to me. Even though I kind of, I mean, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had heard people had bought someone's consignment shop or the manager ended up taking it over from the owner and things like that. But it just didn't sink in that I could, you know, call up a business broker and say, where are the consignment shops for sale and buy one. But that's exactly what someone can do. They can go about the process of finding consignment shop for sale. And so how would you do that? You know, there's a couple, there's many, many ways to do that, including a very straightforward way, which is finding a business broker who is selling consignment shops. Um, That's number one. Uh, Another one is certainly just, you can literally just Google and find a number of online listings of consignment shops that are for sale. Certainly talking to people in your own community who own them about um, their plans to uh, what their future pants are for their store and letting them know that, you know, you might be interested is certainly something uh, that can be done. But the bottom line is buying one is a completely different scenario than starting one from scratch. Now, my business partner and I, we started our consignment shop from scratch. And so that has its own unique, uh, you know, dynamics when you're starting something from scratch. So there is no built-in audience. There is no um, engine that's turning already. You're not going in there and improving someone else's um, business. You you literally have no business. So so anyway so, so anyway we we started from scratch because again capital N naive. You just got to be really naive to um, to do this and and think you're going to be successful. So um, 
needless to say, we jumped in with um, with both feet, and you know, we we, the, we were the easy stuff is really the build the build out or the 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 filling out of the space and all of that. But what was really challenging and difficult for us was um, finding the right space. And you know, when you talk about just being super green about how to go about, I mean, we. We were looking at, like, I remember one property we looked at was a former restaurant or like a subway store or something like that. And, I mean, I later learned that if you're looking for a retail space, you look for retail spaces. I mean, you just don't look at any space. So we looked at a wine bar where they had had to have, you know, torn out the the, the bar that was left over. And, you know, the, these were not, again, it's kind of funny how they think back on it. We didn't even look for a retail space, like where the build out already had a dressing room or, you know, it was set up in a way that would make sense. So we, uh, <laughs> we looked at all kinds of spaces and learned all kinds of things. And, and what we learned a lot is that landlords really don't want to spend any money um, to, uh, if they don't have to, to, to take a space and, and make it suit you. So that's money that has to be spent probably by the people uh, yourself wanting to rent it. But nonetheless, um, we did end up eventually finding a space and it was so much better than the, than one we had looked at did not, that did not pan out for us. So, um, uh, it worked out. It was a former retail space and we, it already had two dressing rooms and we ended up buying fixtures from the previous owner and literally, you could you just like it was almost set set to go from the beginning. I mean, we made certain modifications to it, tore out a front desk. We obviously repainted everything, um, and started uh, shopping for the the furniture. So um, we found went to a lot of. I mean, that's the fun. A lot of the fun and the easy part is the build out and and, and stocking it and getting it looking just right. I mean, that's certainly it's very straightforward. You go out, you hunt, you gather, and you pay for it. So. So that was pretty easy. Um, some of the things that, uh, and, and the timing of which that, you know, I'm not, we weren't really um, familiar with was when to get what permit. So there's a lot of permits that you need with the city. Um, and, you know, we were already set up with our, our business was, was already set up, but that's a different story than setting up with the city and getting all the permits. I mean, something as simple as, uh, needing a permit in order to have a, an alarm system put in. For example, they won't install it uh, unless you've already got the uh, this permit from the city that lasts a certain amount of time. So there's lots of permitting um, and timing on that. Uh, we actually, our building is in a historic area. Um, so there's a lot of um, restrictions on the kinds of signage that you can put out in the store. And so uh, we had to submit proposals for signage and and have that approved by the city. I mean, there's a lot of lead time that we just um, hadn't factored into everything. So, you know, because you're not really going to be putting permits into a city for a signage when you don't yet have a space. So um, that was all very interesting. And and the other part was um, was the whole concept of branding and. In the consignment industry, there it certainly um, is traditionally been very small businesses, mostly women-owned, um, that have opened up, and you know uh, where there weren't um, a lot of, of emphasis on branding in terms of how the logos looked or the name or things like that. And one of the things my business partner and I really focused on was how do we set ourselves up from the beginning for growth and for the future, and. Um, you know, we obviously joined our names together in order to create the name of our store, but it was more than just the name was, um, was the branding. And we were very fortunate to be introduced to a gentleman named, uh, Alex Swart with a company called Swart Ad. That's a branding, uh, it's an, it's an expert branding, uh, company based in, uh, Pasadena area or LA area and they were able to do the branding we hired them to do the branding for our company and that logo has been something I feel like really helped set us apart from the beginning and for the perception of our, our company and everything that we were doing to make it very very uh, you know upscale uh, something that could be replicated something that could be franchised something that could be you know, bought and sold, uh, grown. I mean, everything really kind of began with the concept of that logo. And 
I'll never forget the day we had our, our, our presentation. And the presentation we had was, it was mind blowing because it was, you know, like a real, <laughs> a real presentation, like you see on television, you know, like I was in a movie, you know, where they, they sit you down and they go through all of the high level ideas and concepts about your logo and your branding and who you are. And they take you through this, this story of how they got to where they ended up and you see drafts of other ideas. And in the end you see the final idea and the explanation and, and it just blew us away and we could not be more proud of the logo that we developed for our company. And, you know, that of course then means uh, it was a square logo. So we, of course, we decided to make really nice square <laughs> business cards to help set ourselves apart and, and little things like that. So in the beginning, um, these are all big, big things to think about. And if you go back to the idea of um, starting your own company and your own store versus buying one, um, there's a whole set of issues in terms of when you are starting from scratch is people finding out about you. And we didn't go into this with some humongous ad budget by any means. And so I turned to social media and, and what's so interesting is a lot of the activities that I, I, I did in those early days that I thought would be helpful weren't. And a lot of things that I did that I didn't think would be very impactful were. And um, one of the most important things that I did was um, I had Googled, I think, like the top 10, 20 places to list your business online. And I made sure that our brand new business was everywhere you could, could possibly be. Um, on Google, on Bing, on Foursquare, on MapQuest, you know, wherever it was that you could be. And I had time in those early days to put it on there. I did. Um, in terms of social media, we set up our accounts for Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook page. We set up our website. I designed the entire website myself using, um, uh, what's it called? Squarespace. Uh, so, you know, all from the beginning were all of these steps that, that you wouldn't have to do if you were buying somebody who was already set up and going. So that's a completely different set of, of activities that we had to do. Now, aside from that, we did, um, decide since we're brand new, we would do, um, ads, um, uh, display ads in local magazines and papers. So we, um, chose the Arroyo magazine, which services the Pasadena and, and surrounding area. We did do an ad in Pasadena Weekly, um, a little bit of advertising on Facebook, but almost not, not much in those early days. I wasn't real sure about it. And so we had to invest the money in having those ads created um, to set the tone for our brand. And so we felt like we, we had a professional photo shoot with images to draw from um, in our, our exceptional logo that had been created and really felt like we were making a statement. So that's a set of expenses and, an, and a set of activities as a new business that would be slightly different than if you were taking on a business that already existed and, you know, reworking it and, and helping it improve. So we did actually look at buying some businesses, um, not, not before we created ours, but after, and this is kind of interesting. We, you know, once you start getting into this whole idea of consignment and you start learning who people are in the community and you start hearing about who's doing what and suddenly, you know, you're you're kind of following your industry, so to speak, in your local market. And we had visited every local store in Pasadena. We had visited as many as we could, could make time for in, in L.A., and of course, I had a, a long-term knowledge of all the consignment shops in New York from my years there and the ones in Atlanta from my years there. And so, um, so anyway, it's, it's a, it's a community that, that kind of knows about itself. So, um, people that I knew in Atlanta and in New York and in LA area, I mean, just a lot of contacts and, um, you begin to hear about businesses that are for sale. So we did look at a couple of businesses um, over the years, and once we opened ours, it was fascinating to see um, to see that and to see how businesses valued themselves and to see what they were asking and um, see where they thought the value was in their company. And so ever since then, we've sort of been, um, you know, talking about it and 
you know, if we have a second store, would we just, you know, open up a new one? Um, would we ever buy an existing store and rebrand it? I mean, these are all conversations that we've had. And, and as we've looked and evaluated other companies, it's really fascinating to see what's going on in there and to see, you know, where is cash flow for a company and, you know, really what's left over and how many employees do they have and, you know, really kind of analyzing all the numbers and then asking yourself, well, what's that worth? What is that worth to me to not have to, you know, create something from scratch? And in the case of having a, a second location, you've already spent the time and the money and the investment in branding and creating that for your brand. So a second location is going to definitely take some advertising um, and starting a, a second location from, from scratch, so to speak. It's going to be a very different scenario than, say, you know, buying one in a market where people know the location. They, they have a history of, of buying there and consigning there and things like that. So, um, so these are all some things to think about in the beginning phases is buying one, starting one. Do you really want to do it? And, um, the timing, permitting, the kind of location that, um, you should be looking for, et cetera. So those are all some of the, the things I wanted to talk about today. We received some advice some, from some other business owners in the area of Green Street Village where our store is located about some things we should think about that they had learned, such as uh, developing your email list from the first day, uh, which is something we did do. We worked very hard to capture names of people who did come in the store and, and get them in, an, in, in, a, in a MailChimp um, and get them set up there. Um, we did work on developing our first newsletter pretty soon, even though there wasn't a lot to talk about. Uh, we did have a lot of those early images of us building out our store, uh, going to Ikea, you know, images of the store empty or when we put our first something in there. Um, we put that on Instagram. Um, and I'd actually heard someone in a in some sort of interview talking about how they were so busy building their company, they forgot to document it. And um, the point they made was, it's going to be really important to document what you do in the early days of your business because you're going to want to go back and see how far you've come and be inspired by that and and remember. And there's some funny, funny pictures of my business partner and I at the Henry Hanger Company in downtown L.A. And, I mean, we're like, analyzing hangers and I mean it was one of the biggest investments that we made were these black uh, really cool rubberized hangers and um, and and like you go there and I mean this company is it's like a family-run company they've been around for just years and years and years and like like Chanel uses them to create their hangers so like every major retailer out there is has um has probably used Henry Hanger Company, but um it was fascinating. We analyzed the colors, the texture, like what kind of image. I mean, something as simple as the fixturing was really important for our for our space. And there was another um, store in downtown LA, not too far from Henry Hanger Company, where we got some fixturing, we got supplies, mannequins, and we had a <laughs> we put some of this on Instagram too. I mean, I mean, just choosing the mannequins. I mean. There's, if you haven't gone mannequin shopping in a while, it's pretty amazing because like they have these Brazilian mannequins <laughs> where there's a real emphasis on like certain, like, you know, apple bottoms, so to speak, like certain body parts and like facial expressions and things. Um, you can have mannequin without a head, with a head, you know, and, you know, different poses and, you know, in, in, in like there, it's a fixed position. So there's so many different poses these mannequins could have. And you have to kind of decide which one is best. So my business partner had this great idea. He says, you know, we should bring some clothes with us and put them on the mannequin, see how they look. And sure enough, um, it made a difference in us being able to decide which ones to buy. But um, he was really sad we didn't get the Brazilian mannequins. But I'm telling you, it would not have worked. Uh, you know, can you imagine like a Chanel dress on, on one of those Um probably first of all wouldn't fit because it'd be too narrow but um yeah yeah it was kind of funny 
So um, those are all things to consider uh, and, and the costs and the expenses. I can say that, you know, whatever we thought it was going to cost us, it was like twice as much. Uh, whatever we thought we were going to spend, it was a whole lot more. And just so many things you can't anticipate uh, in the beginning. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was critical is the budget that we created where we, we went through and we, we tried to come up with every conceivable thing that we thought we would have expenses for. And like, it still was like twice as much, um, not exactly twice, but as we've grown, obviously there are things that grow with that expenses that grow. So, I mean, we're strong on eBay. And so even every time we're making more and more money on eBay, those eBay fees, keep going up too. So, um, that's a great example of that. So as a brick and mortar store, um, you know, one of the things that, that we did that in those early days that I would really recommend to people is to get online. And I had been reselling myself through my Jenny girl's closet and I was very, very familiar with eBay and I, um, I was, was comfortable with the platform. I was very knowledgeable with it. And, so one of the things we did was to get up online right away. Now, one of the things that I had forgotten about is that when you're a, a, a baby starting out on eBay, you got to start from scratch. You got to kind of earn your stripes. So there's um, there's limits to how much you can sell in terms of the quantity and the uh, the amount of the inventory on eBay in those early days when you're proving yourself as a seller. And we had... Uh, we didn't really realize that, and it was a rude awakening uh, when we had a lot of inventory we wanted the list, and we just couldn't do it. So we weren't able to get a hundred percent of our inventory up on eBay, and you know, right away. It's something that we phased in over time, and it was so important to have that eBay store for us. And it is the single most important thing that we did in order to be. Um, successful as quickly as we were is to go online and that really is the future it's the future of our business it's the future of of most businesses and all the industry uh, articles that are out there point to the trends in this area so getting on eBay was the single most important thing that we did going online so over time as we sold on eBay um, we were able to get our limits raised and raised and raised and so we were finally able to get all of our inventory on there, but we didn't have the time. And so we had this really aggressive plan that, um, you know, when we, when we, we, um, got into it, we're like, okay, nothing hits the sales floor until it's up on eBay. And so starting from the newest inventory and then working our way backward into the beginning of time, we managed to get every single piece up online. Um, and with our, um, incrementally letting them allowing us to have more and more inventory on there we were able to have a limit high enough and an inventory um, limit high enough and um, value high enough to get all of our inventory on there because we were calling them going look ebay we're selling you know three thousand dollar chanel handbags and fifteen hundred dollar louis vuitton tote bags and we have all these luxury goods in here and we you know we just don't have any space and so they would work with us very well to make sure that we had, you know, enough space to incrementally eventually get it all on there. So we, we credit them very well with that. So these days we have a hundred percent of our inventory on eBay. We're growing very strong and that's literally the single, again, I'm repeating myself a third time. The single most important thing we did was to go online. And that's, it's really important because so many of these, um, Shops are brick and mortar shops, and I'm not talking about online reselling. I'm not talking about online consignment. I'm talking about your traditional brick and mortar consignment shop and um, them going more and more online. And so for those, uh, we have a software that we use. We use this software called um, Liberty uh, by a company called Resale World. And it is one of the leasing software companies that works with the consignment industry. There are others, um, but this is the one that we have chosen. And they have an eBay integration with the software. So it allows you to push your inventory up to eBay seamlessly through the software so that if something sells in your store, it pulls it down from eBay. Um, when it sells on eBay, it all shows up in your um, in your management um, 
tab within your, your system. When there's a sale, you get notifications and it tracks everything. It tracks everything you need for the online sales. And it's just um, a huge, huge asset to us that it's integrated in there. Now we have plans to go on other platforms. We're sort of waiting for our software to um, work with some other vendors where we can push your inventory up to more than one because if it's not integrated then you have to manually input when you have a sale on an outside platform and we're like no we're not going to do that we're going to wait until it's integrated and in the meantime just you know do everything we can to maximize our store and our visibility on eBay and basically take it from there so this is part one of how to open up a consignment store. So we've covered why you want to do it, your passion, should you open up your own shop or should you buy someone else's. When you do open up a store from scratch, some of the things to think about in terms of getting the word out and advertising your store, the branding and going online versus buying a store that someone else has already owned that you take over and improve. Now, since we have never done that, I can't speak to that. Um, I have some ideas about it and how that might be or things that I might do, but I can't speak with it with any authority because I just haven't done it. So should that day ever arise, I will speak to that. But those are the two scenarios to think about. So there you have part one of how to open up a consignment store, things to think about. And there will be other parts to this. So I hope that you'll subscribe and listen again. This is Jenny Walker with Jenny Girl's Closet, Walker Vine Luxury Consignment, and um, our little closet conversations. Thank you for joining us.